Welcome to Full Gospel Fellowship. If you like what you see here, hit that thumbs up and remember to subscribe to our channel. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. We'll be in Colossians chapter 3 and 4. Does anyone here have an NIV with them? Does anybody here have an NIV book with them? No. Okay, that's all right. Uh, there's an issue in chapter 4 in Colossians that we'll get to that I ran into when I tried to read the NIV. I found that by reading the NIV after I read King James, it sometimes clarifies things, and sometimes it creates a problem. I know I've got a book called Colossians in here somewhere. <laughs> I've got so many markers in here now, it's hard to get, get done. It. You know, it's a good thing that, that we now that uh, the world is starting to settle down and you're beginning to see who's, who's who, you can point to one side or the other through the world and say this isn't right that is it's a shame though that our nation split almost 50-50 right down the middle end times did you know that a few days ago there was an earthquake <laughs> southwest of Odessa at about a 3.5 did you know just a couple of days ago there was one between uh, Cuba in Jamaica, it was a 7.7. .7. So oh, they're starting to increase. They really are. And like birth pains, if, if any of y'all have dealt with someone who's fixing to have a kid, you realize that they not only come closer together as time goes, but they get more intense. And you're seeing that today. Another incident happened not too long ago, a few days. Iran, or one of their proxies, lost, launched a missile at one of our embassies and hit it. How long do you think that the U.S. is going to continue to accept that kind of abuse? That's an act of war. An embassy belongs to the country whose embassy it is. That was an absolute act of war. But what is going to come of this? Trump has been very patient. He's got more problems because of the distractions going on. But God is resolute. And he means what he says. Those people that go out of their way to cause problems are going to get it back in spades. And we'll get into that in Colossians here. God's got this. God's got this. You know, no matter how bad it looks to us, we're on the winning side before we start. So we'll let me get my paperwork out here. We'll get started on this. There was a question asked uh, last week of why do people in the Old Testament live longer than those in the New Testament? Well, you can't take a question like that and just spit it out because there's a lot involved. First of all, the Old Testament is going to have to be split into three different time periods. The 
pre-flood, people lived a thousand years or close to it, give or take a few years. After the flood, for the first 500 years or so, people lived to be two or 300 years. And after that, they haven't lived any longer than they do today. Uh, King David was in his late 60s, uh, early 70s when he died. That's what most people do today. He received the best care and treatment that anybody could. Most of us get good treatment today. So the actual lifespan of a person is whatever God decides it to be. It can be as much as a year, two years, or a hundred years or 120 years, whatever God decides. There's no time from Abraham, who lived to be 175. After that, there was only about 100 years at the most, 110 years. And then it slowly backed off. I hope that answers the question. It could be uh, prior to the flood, they believe that the oxygen levels were twice what they are today, which would help kill bacteria or anything that would cause some of the problems. After the flood, the erosion and stuff that takes place dissipates the minerals and the things that we need to have productive farms to grow. So that's the only answer I can come up with. Or whoever wanted to know. Verse 1, starting with chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, and set your affections on those things above, not on the things of earth or on earth. What things? What things should we set a heart on in heaven? How about crowns? How about the crown of life? Turn, if you will, to James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Also, Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried and that ye have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's worth, worth living for, or worth dying for. Crown of righteousness. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.8. I know it's in here. There we go. Second Timothy four eight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them that also love his appearing. How many people here is looking for him to show up any day? 
There's a crown set aside for that. So when's it going to be? Don't know. How soon is it going to be? Don't know. Is it going to be? You betcha. <laughs> you, can, you can count on it. It's going to happen. So all of those that, that are just wondering when it's going to happen, believe that it's going to happen. Be looking for him. Because when it happens, it's going to be just that quick and then it'll be gone and over with. A crown of glory. How many here wants a crown of glory? First Peter. Chapter 5. Verses 1 through 4. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for the filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's a compliment to you, sir. There's conditions, though, that it was just listed. One is neither being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. There is a tremendous responsibility or pastor in a church. There is a tremendous responsibility for being a Christian. And it matters not whether it's from up here or whether you're talking to your neighbor or talking to uh, anyone that you meet on the street. You have an obligation to carry on with God's work, everybody needs to be a witness. Did you know that it wasn't until the third century before they actually had organized church, such as this, where you have a cler clergy, cler clerical uh, people that's been appointed to teach or preach? And interesting, for 200 years, people met in the homes. That was the church. It's the people that's the church. Uh, one person made a comment about chewing gum in the sanctuary. And it was pointed out that actually the sanctuary was doing the chewing, which is each and every one of them. This is just a building. That's all this is. It's where we get together and try to do God's work. But this is only where we get together to do that. You still have an obligation once you leave to carry on God's work. It's an ongoing thing. It's a living thing. Do you all understand what I'm saying here? Me being up here, I take time to research what I'm going to say. I don't always know that that's the way it's going to come out. Because when the Holy Spirit gets involved, then you're no longer in control. And that's the way it should be. The Holy Spirit is the one that rules the roost. Hmm. Another crown. A crown in, in, incorruptible. 1 Corinthians, verse 9, 22 through 27.
to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in the race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Most of these athletes, if you will, uh, are looking for the glory of being the best. They strive to be the best, and they should. But it's, it's corruptible. It, it, it means nothing. A year or two later, and what happens? Nothing. They're waiting for the next contest to prove that they're even better. And it takes time. Therefore, I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should have been cast away. Um, missed a little phrase right here. 25, and I'll read it again. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, or he's reasonable. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And that's referring to the crown. What other kind of crowns are there? Crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. First Thessalonians. 19 through 20. Chapter 2, 19 through 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. So how many people here is actually happy? That many, huh? Why not? We have the greatest promises on earth that's given to you as a Christian. Now, I didn't ask, do you have problems? Because I know you do. Everybody does. But that's not the basis of whether you're happy or not. The basis of being happy is taking the promises of God, standing on them, How long are our lives? I don't know. All those that came before us and are gone are waiting for God's judgment. We're close to that, most of us. There's no guarantee that we're going to live past tonight, tomorrow. Car accidents, sicknesses. There's been a whole slew of things happening in the world. China has come down with a coronavirus that they believe that came from their uh, weaponized uh, military uh, biological 
uh, apparently it escaped in the town where it all started. They've lost about 146 people already, died. And they believe that over 90,000 has been infected in China. Pestilence. It's another mark toward the last days. It's coming. And it's coming quicker. And it's coming faster. The volcano that happened in uh, the Philippines a couple of weeks ago, earthquakes. We should not be sad about that. We should be thankful and grateful that God has already had a plan for us. So what else do we need to consider uh, for our heavenly uh, to set your affections on in heaven? How about people that's gone on before us? People that we've loved. Family, friends, and the treasures that you should be storing up in heaven. Or do you want to stay here where all the trouble's going to be? You need to think about that. I know it's a serious, serious thought, but we're getting at that point where there are decisions going to be made for you, whether you like it or not, by our governments by other governments, by Satan that's, that's trying his best to destroy anything and everything. But the promises of God are still there. They are still current, and they're still effective. He expects you to present the kingdom of God so other people will have an opportunity to get there too. It's not an easy task, especially under the circumstances. I'll continue on. For you, verse 3, chapter 3, Corinthians. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, and then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, the fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, Evil concupiscence, that word incidentally means uh, desire. I don't know why they picked such a big one. Concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which he also walked. Sometime when you lived in them. We've all been there. We've, but now you also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. And lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You know, when you turn on the TV and, and the news pops up, uh, it's not worth watching. <laughs> it's really not. You watch what's going on in the United States that's going to affect each and every one of us. God is going to punish those that have violated his principles. Uh, abortion is murder. There's no question about that. I don't see how anybody could twist it and come up with anything else. You can't. So what's going to happen? Two choices. They can take the punishment and wrath that God is going to dump on them if they were unwilling to change or repent. And the only way they're going to repent is if they get the word of God and accept it. And the only way they're going to get the word of God is if it's preached to them. 
And if they don't come in the doors to be preached to, it has to be done outside. That's your job. That's your responsibility to spread the word that God has laid on all of us to try to save as many people as we can. That's a heavy responsibility when you stop and think about it. And that's another problem, is taking the time to stop and think about it because of the problems that we have during the day, jobs that people have to go to, the people you have to deal with on those jobs. Doesn't leave a lot of time. And there's not a lot of time left, people. Time is getting short. It really, really is. Uh, for those of you that, that are my age and possibly a little younger, you may remember what it was like back in the early 60s. 1963, they took prayer out of school. That's when it really started going downhill. Madeline O'Hara, uh, one person complained and file a lawsuit in the Supreme Court of the United States, and they took it out of the schools. Not good. Not good. It breaks my heart, really. The what? It's going the other way now because people are getting out and standing up for God. But now's not the time to slack off. This is the time to really pour the coals to it. There's so much that uh, needs to be said in so little time. Go to verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is new in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scathian, bond or free, but Christ is in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Forgiveness is the answer to most of everybody's problem. People that become bitter, they're missing it. Forgiveness will overcome bitterness. And bitterness will kill you if you maintain it and hang on to it for whatever reason. I've seen it in my family. Uh, it just seems like they can never get, get their head up. No matter how much you try to help people, if they maintain, want to hang on to these hurts and the correction, that they, they ignore the correction. And it requires first to repent and forgive. And then God will fill in the blanks and fill, fix it. God can fix anything. How many here understand that? That God can fix anything. There's nothing too hard for him to do. But it takes you working hand in hand with God to do these things. And it's hard. Sometimes it is really, really hard. It takes all you got, but you can do it. And above all these things, verse 14, put on charity, which is love which is the bond of perfectness. 
and let the peace of God rule your heart. To which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. My wife told me I had to read this real fast. Wives, submit yourself to your husband, and, and it is fit in the Lord. I told her I'd get through that real quick. <laughs> Y'all have heard it before. And husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that the Lord, you shall receive the reward of of the inheritance for ye to serve the Lord Christ. How many realize that when we get to heaven, there is going to be an inheritance that Christ is going to share, and it's his inheritance. Can you imagine what that entails? Can you imagine the whole universe is his? But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. That means it doesn't matter who you are, who you think you are, who you have been, who your parents are. You violate God's law, you suffer God's consequence. Period. So these people that are doing their best to destroy the people in our nation, these people that are trying to destroy the nation for their own glory, for their own power and their own purposes, God's got this. They are going to pay the price unless they repent and come to, come to God. So he's, he's got it. He's got it uh, well in hand. Now, chapter 4. There's not a lot that it tells you other than commending the people that Paul has known and introducing people that, that uh, he has met there. But there is one difference, and that is chapter 4, verse 15. And this is what I run into. Uh, as a problem. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. The NIV puts it slightly different. The NIV says, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nympha and the church which is in her house. Now, I wrestle with that. You would think that somewhere along here, they would have got it straight, whether it was a he or a her. Somebody dropped an S or added one. So, Smith's Bible Dictionary. Give me the answer that I was looking for. Nymphus. A rich and devoted Christian in Laodicea. His house was used to a chapel, uh, as a chapel. Some ancient manuscripts say Nymphus was a woman. 
a view which is adopted by the Greek church. What does that bearing does that have on what we read, read here? Absolutely nothing. You're going to run into, I brought it up simply to point out that you're going to run into differences in the scripture from different versions. And it was not only the NIV, every Bible that I have, and I have several of them, uh, whether it's uh, American Standard Revised or whether it was uh, Jerusalem Bible, they say it was Nympha. Those are the kind of things that crop up as you're reading the scripture that some people want to make an issue over. It doesn't matter whether it was a he or her. They were Christians, and they did what they were supposed to do. They did the right thing. Any questions? That bugged me, because you'd think that they could get that straight when they wrote these, these manuals, but I wasn't there, and I don't know anybody that was. If you all go ahead and, and read uh, chapter 4 on your own, it will pretty much cover uh, Paul thanking the, the Laodiceans and several other churches along there for the, doing what they were supposed to do as Christians. I know it wasn't uh, the best presentation on this. There's... Uh, a lot going on, but I thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And the whole purpose of this is to get you you to think. God, God speaks to each and every single one of you. The Holy Spirit speaks to each <laughs> and every one of you. Now, I can bring something up and point it out. The way I see it, does that make it right? No. The Holy Spirit has to present it to you in a way that you understand it. And it won't do it if you don't read it. So I'm encouraging each and every one of you to understand. I've I seen a statistic today that said nine out of ten pastors do not know the scripture in today's churches. That is a sad commentary on the church today. But looking back in my past, I can almost believe that because I haven't learned a whole lot sitting in the pew until I started reading it for myself. And that's what you're going to have to do. One step at a time. I thank God for every one of y'all. I love every one of you. But time is getting short, people. You've really got to dig deep and start studying the Word because it's the only thing, the only thing, Thing that's going to save you. Time is short. So I'll turn it back over to the pastor. Ouch. Appreciate the word. Uh, there's, I'm going to read this scripture real quick. Well, unless it just disappeared on me. Matthew 12, 35. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Whatever's in here is going to come out of here. And whatever comes out of here is what's in here. Amen? And, and I think about, it, you know, we, we, can, we can say, well, you know, why don't people come to church? And we always want to put the blame on something else. It's the church. It's the preacher. It's this. It's that. It's the music. Whatever. We got to pray that people develop a desire for the word. That's what how we got to pray. 
There's no trick to this. There's no uh, thing that we got to do to make people come to church except pray for them that they develop a desire for the Word of God. Amen? God didn't tell anybody to entertain folks to church. He said, preach the gospel. Lift him up, and he'll draw all men unto him. Amen? We have to pray for that. we got to look at the Word for what it is. And I know I'm speaking to people that believe this way. The Word's a treasure. I mean, I get excited coming, not just because I get to preach most of the time, I get excited to hear what God's going to say, even though I'm preaching. I get excited to hear what Lauren's going to say on Wednesday nights. I was excited to come to church because the word's a treasure. And out of the heart, a good man out of his heart brings forth treasure. If this beca- the word becomes redundant, we're going to die spiritually. But if we stay in the word, learn for ourselves, get into the word for ourselves like he was talking about, Develop that desire that we should not, we should be in a position where we can't wait to come to church to be able to hear what God has to say. Too many people want to say, well, I like to hear this one and I like to hear that one. Who cares about our personal preferences? It's not about the one that speaks. It's about what's, it's about God is the one who's the ultimate speaker through whoever he is using. Amen. God speaks through you. He speaks through me. He speaks through Brother Lauren or whatever preacher that we get that comes here uh, or whatever teacher. So we come to listen to, to, to the Lord through that vessel. We don't come to listen to a vessel. Does that make sense? God, what do you have for me today? I come to hear you. Not Brother Billy or anybody else. I come to hear you. And when we know that God's the one speaking, then we should never get tired to come to church. Tired of coming to church and tired of hearing the word. I can't wait to come to church. God, help us to have that desire. And God, let's pray for people out there that don't have it yet to develop a desire for your word. And people will start coming to the church. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for uh, bringing us all here tonight. And we just uh, thank you for Brother Lauren's obedience to bring forth what you gave to him. And we thank you, God, for speaking to us tonight, Lord. And help us always to recognize that you're the speaker. You're the one talking to us, and help us, God, to, to, to remember that, and knowing, God, that, that, that we need to listen to what you have to say. We need to obey your word so that we can be blessed, that we pray for the protection, your protect, protective hand to be upon every person here, Lord, as we go about our week and our business, and, we, and that you would bring us back Sunday morning safe and sound, and we thank you for that. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.